Hello, good morning everyone. I'm happy to be here today. Before presenting the state of progress of the hydrogen sector in France, I'd like to give you some facts about the attractiveness of our country. So first, uh, for the third consecutive year, France is the first country to host foreign investment in Europe in 2021. Then, France welcomed a record number of projects according to EY Barometer, up 24%. France ranks first in Europe for hosting industrial activities as well as, as, well as for R&D. In France, we offer the best research tax credit, CIRR, in Europe, up to 30% of the R&D expenditure. We have a world-class infrastructure and Europe's densest transport networks. France is the second largest European economy with over 500 million consumers accessing to the European market. With 1 million engineers, France is the European country with the largest number of skilled workers. There was recently a significant reduction in corporate tax from 33% in 2017 down to 25% in 2022. And finally, recently we had the launch of a 100 billion uh, euros relaunch plan to support production, transform infrastructure and invest in training. That's very important. That will further strengthen France's competitiveness and contribute to the support of foreign investment projects. Finally, I would like to thank the entire Business France team for its indispensable, indispensable support to the success of this mission and the members of the French delegation. So I'm here to talk about hydrogen mobility in France. Um, and I could say hydrogen mobilities in France. In France, there are several clusters and associations. At the top, uh, and in contact with the ministers, France Hydro Hydrogène and Mobility Hydrogène France, the mobility branch of France Hydrogène. They are dedicated to hydrogen. Then the cluster Pôle Véhicule du Futur, Pôle Vehicle of the Future, uh, that is techno-neutral. We address all technologies uh, depending on each use case. And we advise and we help our members. And we address hydrogen for mobility and all other uses, such as stationary applications, energy grid, and also industry decarbonation. This is a complete value chain. Sorry, it's in French. But what is important to, to catch is that in France, we have a complete value chain from the production to the log logistics of the hydrogen to the end use. A few years ago, there was almost no support from the government because hydrogen was important but not a strategic priority. Things changed in 2018 with a first national plan, 100 million euros. Now it seems quite little, but in 2018 it was a very uh, strong uh, signal for all the sector. Then two years later, in 2020, the uh, French hydrogen plan was increased up to 7.2 billion euros public funding. This is not the total funding for private sources and public sources. This is only the public funding. And about one year later, about two additional billion euros of public funding for very important projects I will speak later. And recently, uh, at the beginning of March 2022, 
very large projects were notified, were selected in France. So the hydrogen strategy in France, first, the goal is to accelerate the ecological transition and also to create a dedicated industrial sector. And there are three main objectives. First is related to hydrogen production through electrolyzers with a target of 6.5 gigawatts in 2030 installed in France. The second target is to develop clean mobility, especially for EV vehicles. And the uh, third objective is to build in France an industrial sector that creates jobs and guarantees our technical and technological mastery. Here you have some uh, figures. In 2030, the light vehicles, the target it is 300,000. For heavy vehicles, such as buses, trucks, the target is 5,000. About the trains, the target is 250. Uh, the boats, 1,000. And the hydrogen refueling stations, it's 1,000. Currently, we are on the roadmap to succeed in those targets, but 2030 is not yet, so we have to carry on pushing a lot. This is the uh, project I mentioned before. This is important projects of common European interest. In Europe, the different member states are not allowed to uh, provide funding over a certain uh, threshold. But in this case, when the, important is pro uh, the project is very important for Europe, Europe uh, selected some projects where each member state can overpass largely the uh, maximum uh, usual amount. And so this is uh, a list of projects uh, that were listed, officially listed in France and that were selected. So we have a first list of fif uh, 15 um, uh, important projects of common Euro European interest. And this is just a first wave. A second wave is still in the pipe, but we have to find uh, uh, first the money and then uh, are they really uh, important and priority for Europe and France. Now let's move to hydrogen production. I'm here to talk about mobility. But mobility for the moment in France, but also all over the world, the offer in terms of vehicles is not really available. And the uh, hypothesis that is made is that industry decarbonation projects in the next three to five years will drive up the uh, hydrogen production uh, with uh, projects all over France uh, between two, uh, 200 and 500 megawatts and also uh, up to one gigawatt. And they will be connected through pipelines. Compared to uh, current uh, hydrogen refueling stations that are in operation or that are under construction, the uh, power is from two to five megawatts. Uh, that means uh, less than one ton every day, uh, up to two tons. So there is a ratio of 100 between current mobility uh, consumption and uh, industry decarbonation uh, uh, consumption. And so the hypothesis we can make, the future is not, uh, is not sure, but is that in, the, uh, in this decade, the uh, projects, uh, vehicle projects will be uh, developed, vehicles will be available, and after 2030, there will be a very uh, rapid ramp up of vehicle, uh, hydrogen vehicles uh, deployment, and then their hydrogen consumption. The goal of this scale-up in, in hydrogen production is the uh, decrease of the hydrogen cost for every kilogram. Uh, 
I saw that uh, in Korea uh, at the refueling station, the price is between uh, maybe uh, 7,000 7, uh, won to uh, maybe 9,000 uh, 9, won. It's very cheap compared to France. There is about a, a factor two. Uh, because uh, in France, we don't uh, plan to use uh, grey or blue hydrogen for the moment. It's historical and strategic decisions that explains this situation now. Uh, but uh, I think your uh, strategy is very interesting because uh, hydrogen cost is not an issue, to my opinion. And then uh, hydrogen vehicles make sense in terms of operation uh, use. Um, and also the other uh, idea is to reduce the capex. Uh, that means the uh, vehicle cost and also the fuel cell system cost, if we talk about the fuel cell. Uh, and uh, the uh, production, uh, fuel cell system production scale up from some hundreds or from some thousands every year up to uh, hundreds of thousands will reduce the cost and then make uh, hydrogen uh, vehicles really competitive. In France, there is also a question about the centralized or decentralized infrastructure and also the, how you deploy hydrogen refueling stations. So uh, my opinion is that there will be both. Uh, there will be such uh, highways of hydrogen via pipelines in France to transport large quantities of hydrogen. And then, in addition, there will be either uh, daughter stations without inside production, but uh, using a tube trailer uh, hydrogen, and also inside production via electrolyzer. And also, um, in France, the idea is, uh, the theory is to have only green hydrogen. For the moment, it's not the case. And also, green uh, energy coming from re renewables is not available at the uh, threshold, at the level needed. So there will be sure a mix between renewables, will, between nuclear, and maybe gray hydrogen even if it's not something that makes people enjoy a lot. I think it's a good uh, hydrogen source mix to scale up the uh, end use because of competitivity reasons. On the, on the right, you can see uh, a, a certain configuration with a main, uh, main infrastructure with inside production and then secondary small hydrogen refueling stations. That's something that uh, people uh, think about. About hydrogen use in mobility, there are different vehicles and uh, maybe uh, we can consider not only fuel cell systems but also combustion engines, uh, retrofitting and also turbines. So uh, in Korea, as I can see in this uh, h 2 meet but also in France, we have a wide range of uh, vehicle types, both for on-road or off-road. Um, for sure, uh, we can see uh, the Nexo, you well know, in uh, Korea. But also there are projects for utility vehicles in Stellantis, uh, previously Peugeot, Citroën, Fiat, etc. Then Ivia, it's a, a joint venture between Renault and Plug Power. And also uh, buses, uh, intercity uh, coaches, waste trucks, and trucks like Hyundai trucks. And also Gossin, which uh, belongs to the French delegation and was here today. Um, I could mention many other projects for excavators, for planes, for boats. Uh, and what I, I really like is this uh, motorbike. It's a racing motorbike uh, with hydrogen fuel cell. This is not the final goal. This is only the demonstration that in the ultimate constraint of mass and volume of the hydrogen fuel cell, of the high power hydrogen fuel cell, 
we can succeed to integrate it in a small vehicle. And this has consequences for other types of vehicles, such as uh, small planes, uh, small boats, any small but powerful vehicle. And this, this vehicle uh, will have the same performance uh, than a, a GP a motorbike. Here is a list, I won't read everything, but it's important for you uh, to see what are the hydrogen mobility aids. Um, there are fiscal uh, uh, strategies, uh, there is a green purchase bonus, and there is uh, an investment aid for the projects uh, in terms of ecosystems. In France, we develop hydrogen uh, via ecosystems between hydrogen production and distribution and vehicles. And it's the well-known story of chicken and egg. And so you, you can find uh, the, uh, the amount here. I let you read uh, because the presentation is available. Uh, fuel slides about uh, current status of uh, deployments for the buses. There are uh, lots of uh, hydrogen buses in France, either already deployed, either under deployment. And uh, we can see that it's uh, well spread all over France. And uh, hydrogen buses is something uh, very uh, uh, with a, a good business model. So it's a good application, and to my opinion, and if this happens, this is a good uh, idea. In Europe, there is a small overview in the different uh, member states. In terms of trucks, uh, for the moment, there is not a lot of trucks available on the market, but there is Hyundai in Switzerland, and there are other uh, manufacturers, truck manufacturers, that are leading projects for a few vehicles at the beginning and then the scale up. This will mainly happen between 2025 and 2030. About waste trucks development deployment projects, there are also several projects, uh, mainly by cities, because uh, when a city uh, uh, buys um, hydrogen buses, they often uh, study the hypothesis of uh, hydrogen waste trucks. For hydrogen buses, the price compared to diesel version or electric version is quite competitive. For waste trucks, it's more difficult. Uh, because uh, there is not so many uh, waste trucks with hydrogen and the cost is still very high compared to the diesel version. So it's more difficult for waste trucks for the moment than for buses that are spreading rapidly. Uh, there is a very important question in France and probably uh, abroad, um, which is how to convert hydrogen in an hydrogen vehicle. You can choose a fuel cell system. This is the uh, most common projects. But also you can use combustion engines. This is a topic that is uh, largely studied since two years in France. And uh, we can see uh, nowadays recent announcements from Alpine, uh, Formula One in France, from Porsche, and uh, many uh, manufacturers, both for road, use or racing applications. And the question is not to define which solution is better than the other. The question is which, what is the best solution for this application? And we probably can consider uh, the total cost of ownership in terms of initial, initial purchasing cost and operating cost. And uh, for uh, certain vehicles, fuel cell systems are very uh, uh, interesting for uh, efficiency reasons. And in some applications, this is fuel cell, uh, this is uh, combustion engines that are really more interesting because of efficiency, uh, especially in large and uh, heavy load engines. So this is a short comparison uh, on different criteria between fuel cell and uh, internal combustion engine. This was done for a race car in, uh, in uh, endurance such as uh, 24 Heures of Le Mans, but uh, it could be valid for any, any other application.
to decide whether a solution is better or the other. So, sorry, it's in French. The idea is now how to define, if I develop a project, what is the good solution? Either a fuel cell, either an uh, internal combustion engine with hydrogen, a battery, electric vehicle, if this is uh, suitable, or other uh, combustions like alternative fuels or ammonia for very large industrial and mining uh, powertrain. For sure, hydrogen, the advantage compared to zero emission battery electric vehicles is the charging uh, delay and also the, uh, 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 the autonomy. So let's move to the conclusions. In terms of production, uh, there is a massive and semi-centralized deployment plan between large centralized uh, uh, devices via electroly electrolyzers and also uh, smaller uh, production uh, systems in uh, refueling stations. There is, uh, for the moment, uh, free electrolyzer gigafactories in France, uh, and uh, they are all members of PVF. Um, and uh, also, there is a, a mix between renewables and nuclear, because renewables won't be able to fulfill the need for green, uh, for energy to, for the electrolysis in 2030. In terms of distribution, uh, refueling stations are not being a real issue nowadays. Everyone is willing to produce hydrogen and uh, everyone uh, can uh, invest in a station. But uh, for the moment, uh, vehicles availability and cost are the main problem. Um, but a lot of projects are, uh, in, uh, are being developed and as I said, between 2025 and 2030, the things will change rapidly. In terms of use, uh, industry decarbonation will really scale up and drive hydrogen production. Mobility is starting and massive scale up will occur, should occur after 2030. And large components manufacturing projects are on the way, both for electrolyzers and fuel cells and etc. In terms of partnerships, many partnerships were already uh, announced and uh, developments in hydrogen are very fast. We really think that we need to work together with uh, states like Korea. France is a very well positioned country and very attractive, as I told initially. And the delegation of French entities here is very open to partnerships to accelerate together. Now, a brief overview of the French participants. There is Automobile Club de l'Ouest, organizer of the 24 Heures of Le Mans, worldwide known uh, race uh, in, uh, in that occurs in France. Regional Economic Agency of Burgundy Franche Comté, Gossin for uh, Port Logistics, Hydrogen Advisor, uh, worldwide experimented uh, advisor, me for cluster pole vehicle of the future, SNCF, the railway company in France, and SNESI. Now I will give the floor to Raphael Schengen, head of Hydrogen Advisors. Well, it's a real pleasure to be with uh, you today here uh, in Seoul. I will uh, walk you through a uh, comparison of uh, the French hydrogen economy, current development, and strategic orientations in comparison uh, with uh, other countries. So first, uh, let's look together uh, the question of production, primary energy sources, pricing, market structure, and legislation. Whenever you start having a hydrogen economy, the question that comes up is, am I going to produce everything myself, or I am, am I going to import? And if I have excess hydrogen on my hands, May I send it abroad? 
So here in Korea, uh, you will import quite a bit of hydrogen, like you import other energy vectors, and you will have uh, a little bit part of the production that will be local. As you see in Europe, uh, we have countries like Germany that have very clearly stated that they will have very large imports as well, less than in Korea, and that have already started having an international import activity and import strategy. ISS is going to be like 60% local production, 40% import, but we will see how the market goes. Spain, which is with abundant wind and solar in the south of Europe, will produce for itself and then will sell to the rest of Europe the additional capacities that they won't use. So it's going to be, for me, kind of 50-50. In France, right now, the orientation is that we will produce locally and develop local ecosystem, like Bruno showed in the just previous presentation. And if there's a little bit of excess, we'll probably uh, shift it across the border, for instance, towards Benelux or towards Germany. And there might be a little bit of import for our economy. I'm not talking here about transiting flow between Spain and France. So keep in mind, France right now, local production for local use. The next question then is, how do you produce your hydrogen? Here in Korea, it's going to be based on nuclear, it's going to be based on renewable, a lot of wind. In Europe, certain countries are not at all into nuclear. And if you take Germany and Spain, it's a lot of wind and it's then solar. And of course, those who are in the south are blessed with sunlight. So it's going to be much more in Spain than it's going to be in Germany. In France, we're going to have everything. And like in Korea, we have a very strong policy around hydrogen produced from nuclear power. Next to that, we're going to have onshore wind and offshore wind and solar farms. Regarding the commercial approach, the market structuring. Here in Korea, it is right now a lot of gas imports then transformed into gray hydrogen. And so the driving element of the final hydrogen price is the initial natural gas price. In France and in Spain, that have first and foremost right now local ecosystem development, the driver will be the price of electricity from the electricity mix. In Germany, the situation is not similar as, sorry, Germany has already integrated now that there will be a global market with global imports from the entire Europe and the world at large. So they have already, a couple of months ago, established the basis of a very open bidding platform with people providing hygiene and people buying hygiene. So here, there's another difference. How will the French hygiene economy evolve in these environments like the other economies? There are two major factors. The first underlying factor or question is how fast are we going to have hydrogen pipelines running through Europe? We have transport operators in all countries, and about 40 of them to get now are sitting together on a regular basis and laying out the development of the hydrogen pipelines across Europe. And this is a picture of the latest report that has been updated earlier this year. 
And as you see, we're going to have tens of thousands of hydrogen pipeline running through Europe in the years to come. And it's going to happen fast. And what you see here on this map is the yellow lines are new dedicated hydrogen pipelines, whereas the gray line are former gas pipelines transformed into hydrogen pipelines. And you see how this is spanning. You see how France is at a core roundabout location. And so the question for us in terms of market development is when and how fast is this market going to evolve? Because that means the French market is going to move from a local market to a global market. The other underlying question is, you know, what about Europe legislation? And so here there are two questions at stake. The first one is, what about the renewable law? It is being revised right now to include new objectives regarding green hydrogen. And there, there is a fundamental, fundamental new principle that will most likely be introduced, which is the principle of additionality. What is it? If you have green power today, the idea is that this green power goes first and foremost towards power uses, not to the production of hydrogen. And so it will be asked that hydrogen producers develop new additional green power capacities in order to produce green hydrogen. And there is an array of rules around it that I will not detail, but the general consensus in the hydrogen ecosystem, and I used to be the chairman of Hydrogen Europe, so I followed this across the years, the past years, is that it will put a straight jacket on the development of green hydrogen in Europe if things stay as it's currently drafted. The other big question is the question of taxonomy. And in other words, what can we say about hydrogen produced from nuclear power? In the European current taxonomy, we look at the level of emissions related to a given energy. And as a summary right now, hydrogen produced from nuclear power is below the threshold considered as low carbon and so is in the, so to say, green zone. Hydrogen produced from nuclear power is considered as a low carbon fuel as per the European taxonomy. But it doesn't mean that it's going to be green as per the renewable energy directive or the general orientations of greening and decarbonizing the European economy. So we have here a legal regulatory risk that is not fully clarified and that we need to further look at. And it will have, of course, a major impact for the hygiene economy in France because behind this is a question, will the hygiene produced in France from nuclear reactors be a green hydrogen that can be sold all throughout Europe. Now let's move to the technology focus. You have seen what Bruno has showed you in terms of how vibrant uh, and dynamic the French hydrogen technology ecosystem is. And he has told you about the importance project of common European interest. I remind you, these are projects on which the European Commission puts a stamp so that you can go up to 70% public funding 
because they are considered as not harming the competition in Europe. And then it is up to the member states first to put forward projects for stamping and second to fund them. So you can put for projects forward in the field of industries, new products, or ecosystems, or infrastructure. And you, we just had the first batch of projects in the industry validated a couple of weeks ago. And here are the results. And you see that France got 10 projects approved, while Germany four, the Netherlands one, and Spain four. And that's a clear signal to you, similar to what is happening here in Korea, that in France and in Korea, there is a very, very strong focus from the government towards supporting the hygiene industry, the provider of industrial solutions. Of course, there are interests across all countries regarding ecosystem, but then what differs in France is that the government, for the time being, has no intention to support with public funding the development of hygiene pipelines. And that is very different in the Netherlands and in Germany, for instance, who have very strong import policies and then want to shift hygiene across their country via those pipelines. So the, here you have another major difference. I want also to tell you about the dynamism of the stock markets. Uh, we have had, over the past two years, a lot of very successful introductions of hygiene startups with very good valuation in hundreds of millions that you see on the upper right part. I run you through uh, the five of them. First, HDF, Hydrogen of France. This is a company doing, taking green power, electrolyzing it to produce green hydrogen and then putting it back on the grid via hydrogen fuel cell. I tell you then about Afner Energy, which takes biomass and then transforms it into green hydrogen and biochar. So the carbon in the biomass gets into the ground and is being captured. About Opium, which is a company doing, developing a new hydrogen-based car. And then finally about HRS, which is a company doing hydrogen refueling station. As hydrogen advisors, I was involved in the early stage of the INOCA project, which is the flagship project of AFNA Energy. Then the fifth one is LIFE, which is a company doing electrolyzers and very complex uh, digital system to optimize hydrogen production offshore from offshore wind farm and then sending it towards the land. And they have a booth here in Seoul. And I was also involved in the early stage of uh, the company. In terms of areas of focus of the current hydrogen economy and beyond the detail elements that Bruno showed you on buses, trucks, and cars and local ecosystem, I want to give you a high level picture uh, before I leave the stage, which is that with the hygiene economy, you can serve the industry, you can serve the transport sector, or you can provide heat. And you see here very clearly that there is difference between France and other countries like here Korea, where you have some projects related to using hydrogen fuel cell for buildings heating, which is something that we find also in Europe, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in the UK, but which is not present uh, in France. One of the reasons being that uh, we use a lot of uh, nuclear power to heat our buildings and homes. I thank you for your interest, and I wish you a very successful age to meet. And I will now hand the floor to Pascal Demougeau from uh, SNESI. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here to introduce my company, SNESI. SNESI is a French company, but an international group, supporting companies in their development and supporting companies in improving their industrial performance. SNESI is a family-run company with a 70 years old experience in the uh, mobility, uh, in, uh, in mobility industry. We are providing uh, services to uh, automotive industry, but not only, um, based on a unique uh, uh, range of uh, wide, wide range of expertises. These expertises are divided in main two domains. First domain, I will describe more, more detail later, but first domain is commercial development. Here we are aiming to, to, uh, to support suppliers in their uh, uh, growth to make business. Uh, and the second domain is uh, in industrial performance. Here we are aiming to support OEMs as well as suppliers to improve their QCDP. We have a worldwide footprint, obviously in Europe, but not only, also in Asia, you can see Korea, for instance. But we are also aiming to go this year to uh, uh, North America following Stellantis uh, needs. So for the moment, we have uh, internationally 10 offices. We are more than 40, 450 engineers worldwide with 20 nationalities. And we have uh, more than 20, uh, 20 million euro annual turnover. Just here, some figures. In 2021, uh, we have handled 263 projects with 81 new customers. 85% uh, of this project was in the area of automotive. And as you can see, we are also aiming to develop business in the area of new tech and the green tech, including hydrogen. Over the, first, the past five years, more we have been working with more than 400 customers in 50 countries. Just some examples here of customers, just uh, to show you. Also in green tech, in 2021 and this year, this is a list of customers we are working for. And you can, you can easily recognize here some of uh, Korean suppliers as Mobase, Mobis, uh, for instance, LG, uh, and so and so. At Snetsi, we have some strong points. The first, the first one is our expertise level. We are uh, mostly coming from engineering from OEMs engineering, from supplier tier one engineering. So, and very, uh, uh, very, with a very long experience in engineering side. We have a second strong point is the governance of our company. We, are, uh, we have a very stable ownership, fully independent of our company, independent of a, a bank, for instance. And from the beginning of the company, we never lost money. As we saw before, we are uh, uh, internationally uh, located. We are here thanks to a, a worldwide network and to world, world, worldwide experience network. We are very agile. We are very uh, accustomed to uh, listen to the customer need. Uh, and to uh, modify our organization, to modify our skills, to improve our skills, to develop uh, competency, to support our customers. We can take the full responsibility of the project from the very upstream to the mass production event uh, later. And we are uh, a company cost efficient thanks to the organization, thanks to uh, 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 teams not dedicated for one project, but several projects. 
Also, we have some certification and accreditation. You can see here some of them. And we are involved in a lot of trust network in, in Europe, but not only, many in Europe, but not only, as you can see uh, on this slide. So now more detail regarding uh, the provided service. In terms of commercial development, we have uh, four main areas. First one in market survey strategy. Uh, the second one is partnership and mm, mm, partnership. The third one, which is the most important one, is business development. And the last one is aftermarket. I will give you after more, more detail. Regarding market survey, we already have conducted more than 150 studies worldwide in uh, 50, more than 50 countries. Uh, and we have 100% business opportunity identified through these studies. Regarding partnership and M&A, it's the it's smallest activity and smallest service we, we, we provided. But anyway, uh, uh, average, we provide average, an average of five requests. We get a, an average of five requests per year. Um, we have more than 10 targets identified on, for each, uh, each uh, request. And we have more than 100 financial analysis performed in the, in the last years. In terms of business development, uh, just one figure is, is our turnover generated per year to our customer is uh, higher than 400 million euros of global turnover. So we cover all the part of the vehicle, but also not only part, we cover all the system of the vehicle. And in terms of new tech, also, we have a lot of uh, different uh, uh, act, uh, representati representation of supplier in the domain of ADAS, in the domain of thermal management, in the domain of connectivity, in the domain of uh, EV battery, EV motors, DC-DC converters, uh, uh, battery and so on. And obviously, we are aiming to uh, increase our contribution to hydrogen development. In terms of aftermarket, here we produce a wide range of, of parts, dedicated parts for aftermarket. Uh, we manage more than 2,500 new references dedicated to aftermarket. The second domain is the domain of industrial performance uh, improvement with uh, here also different kind of services. First, the purchasing, then the logistics. We are also industrial project management, industrial assessment and quality. We are able to support uh, regarding the training and coaching, and also small activity in terms of sorting and reversing of parts in the plant. Regarding purchasing and logistics, we are, uh, from the very beginning of the project, making a costing simulation, local integration simulation, up to procurement of the part uh, and trade the services. So a full range of services uh, linked to these activities. Just some figures regarding purchasing. 15% gain of purchasing this is the average of uh, the gain uh, uh, we obtain on the different mission different, uh, with a different supplier. So more than 15% of, of uh, uh, cost uh, uh, reduction. More than 12,000, we work with more than 20,000 qualified suppliers in seven, more than 70 countries suppliers. In terms of logistics, we manage uh, more than 40 uh, warehouses in Europe, in Russia, not, not for the moment anymore, but it was in Russia also, and in Africa. We have more than 100 flow managed daily, 
and we manage, we transport 100, uh, more than uh, 100 million parts per year. We can support in the whole, the full line of, uh, of the supply chain, from the supplier to the customer, managing all the different steps uh, uh, of the delivery of the parts. In terms of industrial projects, we are able to manage the industrial projects as, for instance, production line transfer, re-engineering of production line, uh, uh, improvement of the performance of the, uh, of the manufacturing line, for instance. Next, the services is industrial assessment and quality. We have performed ma more than 1,000 1, audit up to now. More than 70 uh, NSC audit per year and in 45 countries. Also, ISA audit uh, in different domains, R&D, sustainable development, quality and manufacturing, supply chain management, and financial audit. Next domain we are able to support the company is training and coaching. We have already trained more than 3,500 people worldwide during the last five years with more than 250 companies. And the success rate uh, of this uh, training is 97%. So customers of the training and coaching we are providing are very, very happy to our performance. Last one is sorting and reworking of part uh, in, in the plant, which you can see here some figures. Focus now on Korea. There are some missions from 2007. In terms of industrial performance, we have made a several audit and supplier for battery producer, for instance. I cannot give the name, it's quite confidential, but uh, we already perform uh, audit for battery suppliers in Korea. We provided a lot of training for project management, for instance. We have been working on sorting in some Korean uh, company and com plant. Uh, and the most important is business development. We are a representative of more than 15 Korean companies in Europe, including GMB, Mobez, Nextship, for instance. Uh, and we have uh, also working to develop uh, some business inside Korea uh, with, uh, with uh, local uh, uh, customers. Also, we have performed some market study inside Korea. So our value, relationship building. When we work with a customer, we, each time we are aiming to uh, develop a long-term uh, long uh, uh, partnership. And uh, this is important for us. We are able to stretch ourselves. We are very agile to adapt to the needs of the new needs of our customers. It's collective engagement and initiative and tenacity. That's for my presentation. So SNESI is very open to work now uh, on hydrogen, to work with Korean company on hydrogen, to support Korean company to develop themselves in Korea, but also abroad, in France, Germany, other countries. We are very open to, to, uh, to, to develop these new activities with, uh, with Korean companies. Uh, and we hope uh, to, to contribute to Korea development as well. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your time. Now, I will, uh, I am pleased to, uh, uh, to introduce Vincent Delcourt from SNCF. Hello, thank you. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here today. I'm very delighted uh, to be here in this great forum. 
just before starting, I would like to thank uh, all the organizations teams, especially Business France and uh, all my colleagues uh, present today. Yeah. Um, just uh, perhaps uh, on the next slide, a uh, few words to introduce myself. Oh, it's me, sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm Vincent Delcourt, as I said, uh, I'm working for SNCF, the French railway company, and I'm in charge of uh, innovation strategy. I'm here today with my colleague Samuel Day, who is in charge of H2 strategy. Um, perhaps uh, just a few words about what is SNCF. I'm sure you know the word SNCF, but uh, uh, more figures to describe our company. Um, SNCF is a French national railway company, of course, and perhaps uh, just a few figures. Uh, we operate more than 50,000 trains per day, and perhaps to give you uh, an idea of the size of our network. Uh, the network is uh, more than 30,000 kilometers. And one point which is really important regarding to the H2 development is the fact that half of the network is non-atrified. What does it mean? It means that every day we are operating diesel train. And of course, we are really committed to change that. How? Of course, by using H2, but not only. Um, another point which is really important, it's the model share of railway transport in France. The model share is not so important, only 10% of passenger transport. It means the main use, main uses for transport in France is car. But if we have only 10% of model share, we produce only 0.6% of the CO2 emissions by the transport sector in France. Why? Because, as I said, if half of the network is non five, if we operate a lot of diesel trains, in the same time, we use a lot of high-speed train, electric train, with a very low emission level of CO2. So, uh, let's go further. Let's go further to the descriptions of our activities in the group. As I said in my introductions, of course, we are operating trains, we are operating rolling stock. But in the same time, we are managing, maintaining, and developing infrastructures for the railway. But as my previous colleague said, we are really interesting, perhaps, to participate to the development of other infrastructures, such as energy infrastructures. In the same time, we are developing, we are building stations all over the world. And of course, there is a link, a strongly link, between the place of the station in the city and the development of transport and a low carbon mobility. Perhaps another name that you could know is Keolis. Keolis is a part of the SNCF group and is in charge of public transport all over the world, especially in North America, in Australia, and so on. So if we talk about public transport, of course, we are thinking about buses. And more and more public authorities are asking us to operate low carbon buses and, of course, H2 buses. If I go further on the, these descriptions, I can talk about freight. Freight, that's the same thing. Freight is, of course, 
um, for Europe to transport goods all over our continent, but now it's a global market all over the world. So as I said for the buses, we are thinking about the development of H2 trucks. This, this uh, short introduction is just to give you an overview of what is our group and why we are committed uh, in the H2 system. So, as I said, we have three main challenges. The first one, which is not a surprise for all of you, is of course to be able to achieve our environmental ecological transitions. Another point is to be prepared for the competitions. For the moment, only one state operators is in France, it's a Howard company. But in the next months, in the next years, competitions will be opened. So we are truly sure that working, developing uh, skills, developing technologies about new energy systems will be a main advantage in our competitions. And the last point is the move, the shift of the customer expectations. Of course, after our the sanitary crisis, the uh, expectations in terms of transport are changing. So what we want to do? We want, of course, to play on the cost management, to reduce our cost, to be more efficient. We want to develop digitizations of the railway systems. We want to, to of course, uh, to well understand our customers' expectations. And, of course, to accelerate the decarbonizations of our systems. So, to do that, as I said, we are developing a portfolio of solutions. Here, it's the H2 Forum and at the same time, in another corner, the Battery Forum. So, we are working uh, on developing a new fuel. We are working uh, to develop battery, battery train and H2 train. Why? Why are we developing a portfolio and not only one solution? Because, as I said, we operate trains all over the country. So, regarding the operating expectations, regarding the uh, uh, environment of uh, operating systems, regarding to the uh, conditions, uh, weather conditions uh, from the north to the south of the France, we are sure that we need to develop few solutions. And the idea to uh, uh, develop these solutions is to reach two main milestones. The first one is to be able to reduce by 30% our CO2 and gas emissions uh, by uh, 2030. That's our first steps. And the second one is the same approximately all over the Europe for mainly companies in France and in Europe is to achieve our uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. So, if I talk about H2 in railway here. So, as I said, SNCF is really committed uh, to develop and to operate H2 train. So, to do that, we have worked with manufacturers, Alstom, we have worked with different public authorities to be able to order a, a first set of hydrogen train. So, the, the first 12 H2 trains will operate from the north to the south of France. And we are sure that um, we, we spend a lot of time not only to develop the train, but 
as we said, I would like just to stop a few seconds about what is for me a key driver of this project, which is the, to be sure that all safety rules will be completely, um, completely analysis. So, um, as I said, we will operate 12 trains, 12 H2 trains by the end of 2025 in France. And it's not the end of the story, it's just a milestone. We want to go further. We are sure that in the next decade, we'll be able to operate around 100 trains, H2 trains. So that just a starting point of the adventure. I don't know, but I think it could be very interesting to uh, share with you a few technical details about uh, what is our H2 trends. Because it's not only an H2 trends, it's more than a, a simple fuel cell trend. Because as I said, a port of our network is electrified and another port is not electrified. So the trains will be a bi-mode train. What does it mean? It means when the train is operated under electrified line, we could use energy supplied by the catenary and the photograph to the train. And when the line is non-electrified, of course, we will use hydrogen. So in the same train, the power tractions will be supplied, of course, all the time by electricity, electricity coming from the network, from the electricity grid, and in another port will be produced on board. So um, the idea is not just to remove, to remove and to replace our diesel power pack. We want, of course, to be able uh, to uh, add a fuel cell, to add the uh, H2 storage, to add batteries, to develop a new uh, energy management systems. And of course, the main constraints are the volume, because in the train, most of the volume is done for passengers. So the only way to do that is uh, to use the roof of the train to be able to uh, have this kind of uh, fuel systems, H2 trunks on the train. If I talk about uh, power, the power of the fuel cell is around 330 kilowatt, 100 kilowatts, sorry. And we have two fuel cells. Uh, if I talk about H2 storage, the amount of H2 stored on board is around uh, 200 uh, kilograms of H2 under 350 bars. Um, the main difference between an H2 train and a diesel train is, of course, the autonomy, the range. The range will be around 500 kilometers. So, if we want uh, to uh, be more competitive, we have to work with different manufacturers to be able to have another way of storage on board. The idea is perhaps uh, to use another pressure, perhaps 700 bars, and perhaps and we were very interesting about a few discussions with current companies about the fact to use liquid hydrogens, which is a big gap for us if we want to go uh, to a larger range for, for the train. So, as I said, uh, that's only the beginning of the story here. We have many technical challenges to take hold if we want to go further. And uh, I'm sure to do that, we need to reinforce two things. The first one is to work on the reductions of the cost. 
the investments and oper uh, operation cost. And to do that, as I said, we want to operate trains, but we want to merge other services, as buses, heavy trucks, and perhaps uh, to use stationary um, uses as uh, uh, H2 genset for a safety generator. So that's the first idea, is not to uh, have only one use, but to be able to merge different uses. And if I go larger, if I enlarge my scope, the idea is, of course, to merge, as Raphael explained, to merge with other industrial activities and to be connected to a backbone, an H2 backbone. Just a few words about the development the time scale between the development of uh, mobility uses and uh, the energy infrastructures. The main point is if we want to be uh, sure to operate in a good con uh, conditions, we have to develop in the same times the uses, and for my part, mobility uses, and at the same time, infrastructures and the idea of what uh, Raphael presented before. Um, just quickly, because I'm not the operator of this service, but just uh, to give you the development of uh, mobility services in France. The first example is uh, the development of uh, hydrogen taxi, especially in Paris. It's the first uh, use uh, for mobility. Another word is uh, development of uh, buses uh, with Keolis. The uh, idea is, of course, to operate more and more H2 buses in France. And just uh, to, to give you a few words, uh, uh, not completely to conclude, but to summarize my speech, is that, as I said, we are interested uh, and all companies in the group are interested by hydrogen and we are strongly sure that H2 could be a solid alternative to diesel. But in the same time, we have to work together, of course, to work on the cost, to work on technological developments to have a response, uh, to reply to the questions of the autonomy. Uh, I don't forget to talk about safety, regulations, and energy efficiency of these systems. So, a lot of work to do uh, to go further in this uh, very, very interesting uh, aspect of H2. Um, another point uh, about uh, the business model um, is the fact if we talk about green H2, so electrolysis, uh, the main part of uh, the cost of H2 is linked to the cost of electricity. So uh, we are strongly committed to work with energy suppliers uh, to find the best way to control the cost of electricity in the future if we want to control the cost of H2. And you know that for the moment in Europe, there is, of course, uh, like all over the world, an energy, a big energy crisis, and the price of electricity is increasing so quickly. So we are asking what will be the impact on H2 price in the future. Um, just a few words about uh, what are the six main challenges for SNCF. The first one, but that's the same thing for all companies, is to able to work together, not to be alone. Stronger is uh, to, to work together is the way to be stronger. Um, to use all our assets, because we are sure that, as I explained, we could uh, use a lot of assets to enhance the value of uh, uh, our uh, contributions in partnerships. Uh, regulations. Regulations is a, a very, very important point. And uh, as I've seen in Korea for free zone, 
we have many questions about uh, what is uh, the way, the best way uh, to have experimentations uh, to be uh, in the same time compliance to uh, safety uh, aspect and safety regulations. Uh, we have to work uh, to develop uh, new expertise and in the same times to develop new technologies to increase the energy efficiency. Yeah. So I'm just on times, 20 minutes. It was a really pleasure uh, to, to make uh, this uh, short presentations of uh, H2 for railway in France and in Europe because I don't mention the development of uh, uh, H2 trends in Dutchland uh, with Linde, <laughs> just uh, close uh, to, uh, to this uh, session's forum. And um, I would like to, to conclude uh, to thank you for your attention. And uh, just uh, before uh, the questions, I would like uh, to ask uh, to my colleagues uh, to join me on the stage. And if anyone has uh, any questions, uh, please feel free to ask us. Thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. Sir.